won't you stand with us and we sing a new song where it's new to me and uh, listen to the words of the worship. Does anybody else make notes for themselves on little pieces of paper? <laughs> that is frustrating, isn't it? Especially when you can't find your little piece of paper. 
And I have little pieces of paper all over the place where I don't know. And then sometimes I'll read the note that I made on a little piece of paper and I cannot figure out what that note means. And I wonder why I put the little note on the little piece of paper. I don't know why I'm telling you that. <clears throat> Other than to tell you this, uh, we are getting ready to go tomorrow morning, leaving at 5.30 in the morning to take a group of, of uh, ladies. Linda and I are taking them to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And, uh, and we have little pieces of paper uh, because uh, it's going to be a busy week and we want to have everything connected. And then when, when uh, we get back, I've got another thing on Thursday morning that starts at 7.30 that I have to be at. And so I'm trying to get all these things in line and so if I preach a message that doesn't sound exactly as uh, it should, it may be the little piece of paper is missing somewhere in that. <laughs> I'll start out with this. Do you know what an oxymoron is? That is not a household cleaner for somebody who's stupid. That, uh, let that soak <clears throat> Oxymoron is a figure of speech containing words that seem to contradict each other. Contradiction in terms, all right? Let me give you a few. Somebody is pretty ugly. That is a oxymoron. They can't be pretty and ugly at the same time, but often we say that, right? <clears throat> How about dress pants? That doesn't seem right, does it? I got a dress pants on. You know, which do you have, a dress or pants? <clears throat> act naturally. Which do you do? Do you act or are you going to be natural? Here for all you Ford lovers. How about a Dodge Ram? Whoa, no, boom. Get it? Dodge Ram, got it? Oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that wasn't even on the little piece of paper. Here's something you might have said to a policeman. That was a rolling stop. It was either a stop or it was rolling, but it wasn't both, right? How about you go to get, a, get an exact estimate of something? Those two don't go together. And for you apple lovers out there, oh, wait a minute, I got one more. For you paid volunteers, how can you be a paid volunteer? And now for your apple lovers, how about Microsoft Works? Uh, it, it often doesn't work. Maybe you have had jumbo shrimp or vegeta vegetation or veggie bowl, vegetable meatballs. You ever had those? No. no, I don't think so either. They don't go along together, do they? Or grape nuts. You ever had those? Those don't go along together either, do they? Well, this passage that I looked at, I just saw so many contradictions in it. It wasn't contradictions in scripture. It's just contradictions that we see and look at and say, how can that be? Those two just don't go together. And so I've, uh, I've put together a few oxymorons for Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Hopefully you have found your place there and would stand with me as we begin reading God's Word. In verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. And the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and to heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and your servant will be healed or my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. 
And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. You may be seated. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, once marveled at the faith of a man. It's the only instance in all of scripture in which he says he marveled at someone's faith. Who was it? Was he a rabbi? Was he a teacher? Was he a disciple? No. He was a centurion, a Roman officer in the military. A centurion is maybe one of the most unlikely persons to would have amazed Jesus. He was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. He, doubt, he undoubtedly had a pagan upbringing. He was a Roman military man whose job was to oversee Rome's rule in Israel and over the Jews. He was a man of war, not a man of peace. He achieved the rank of centurion, which meant that he had a hundred or maybe less soldiers under him. Not exactly a resume that you think of a man that God would choose to exalt and say, wow, what great faith. The only one. The only other time that it says in scripture that God marveled at the faith of someone is when he went to his hometown and he marveled at the faith of the people there because of their unbelief. But here Jesus points out, here is a man, it just amazes me of the faith that he has. So I have a few oxymorons. They're not going to be as clever as the others, but I want to be able to show them to you as I think that they make sense to me at least and hopefully to you that we might be able to pull something from this. The first is a compassionate centurion. He's compassionate because, Scripture tells us, that he has a servant at home. This master has a servant at home, and it says he is highly valued, and he is sick, and he is about to die. Now what is an oxymoron about a compassionate centurion is that as his master, he was not even one of his soldiers. He was a slave, and a slave to a master was not even a person. It was a, it was a possession. He had, he had something in value of him, but it was not a value as a person. But here is a centurion, and he has compassion upon him because he is sick. He could have just thrown him out and brought in ten more servants, but yet he highly valued him as a person, a person that he cared deeply about. Compassion is defined as this. It is feeling deep sorrow for another stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate that suffering. And the difference between pity and compassion is pity just feels sorrow, compassion does something about it. Here's a man who's going to do something about it. And he has come to the place where he wants to be able to reach out. It is in a Christ-like kind of love. It's the same love that Christ had with us. It was not a feeling kind of love. It was an action kind of love. Compassion that has you turn around when you're driving to help somebody. It is the compassion that sees a need and just not just sees it and feels sorry for them, but desires to help in that need. There's a desire to see someone who is mourning, someone who is crying, someone who is hurting, and instead of walking by them and feeling sorry for them, you stop and you put a hand on the shoulder. You stop and you say a kind word. It is the Christ-like kind of love. It's the kind of love that 
a leper would fall at Jesus' feet and said to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me whole. You can cleanse me. And the scripture says that Jesus reached out and he touched him. And he said to him, I am willing. And he was cleansed. Here's a man who who's heard about Jesus, the scripture says. He's heard about him. And he sends a group of people, a group of people of which I say deserves Jesus, Jesus to come and to speak to him and speak to his servant. Look at verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and he sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come to heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Some translation says he built our synagogue himself. Not as though he did it with all his own money and all his own time. He had others that helped him, of course, but he must have been the, the influential person who was there to build this synagogue. The centurion asked for elders to go on behalf of him to seek Jesus to heal his servant. And the elders go and they say, this man deserves to have you come. I noticed that Jesus doesn't say a word after that. Because I think if Jesus were to say a word after that, he would have said, no, he does not deserve me to come. If he deserved something, it would not be me coming. What we deserve from Christ is not that he comes at our beck and call. What we deserve is that we fall at his feet and say we are unworthy. But here is how the people saw him. And it's interesting that the people who saw him were Jewish people. They were Jewish elders, which is very strange because that is odd. The Jewish elders of the, of the city there in Capernaum see this Roman soldier who is over them as someone who deserves to have Jesus come and see him. That's odd. Most people would never say this Roman soldier deserves you to come. They wouldn't even alight this Roman soldier, much less say, Jesus, you deserve to go and see him. In the same way, it goes the other way. The Roman soldiers were not in the habit of being fond of the Jews. They didn't really care for the Jews. They were there to have authority over them and to be over them. We do not deserve the things of God. That's why it's called grace. In this time of illness of this man, he only asked, go and see if Jesus will come and to heal my servant. I don't believe, and I'm pretty sure I'm strong on strong ground in this, that this man never said, come see my servant because I deserve it. And I'm pretty sure about that because he has a response. Here's how the people see him. He's deserving. You know how he saw himself? Scripture tells us. And it tells us in this. He was humble, a humble leader. Look at the second part of verse 6. When Jesus was not far from the house, when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. He says, I don't even deserve to have you come to my house. Now see, if somebody was coming to your house, somebody's coming to my house that, that was of influence, and you knew it and I knew it, you know what we do? We wouldn't send somebody else to say, hey, 
I don't deserve you to come under my roof. We'd get our house cleaned up, right? We'd dust. We'd do everything that needed to be done. We'd get our house spotless as we could get it to welcome this person in. This guy wasn't cleaning up his house. This guy is sending out some friends as he gets there. I can imagine that this centurion is hoping and indeed a, a person of faith that's saying, I'm thinking he's coming and he's watching out the door, watching out the window. And he sees him a long way down the road coming with those elders from the church, those elders from the synagogue. And as he sees them coming, he says to his friends who are there, maybe praying with him, maybe gathered in prayer, seeking that God would come through Jesus Christ to heal this one that he loves. And he sends his friends out to say, you know, my master's back at the house. And he says, don't bother yourself by coming in. He's not worthy. He wanted me to tell you to have you even come under his roof. That is an act of humility. That is an act of a humble servant. He thought of himself not as one who is deserving, but one who is not worthy. Don't trouble yourself. He recognized Jesus' authority. It's interesting, when the Jewish elders were sometimes in a conflict with Jesus, they would ask the question at one time, Matthew chapter tw uh, 21, or I'm, yeah, Matthew 21, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you that authority? Here is a foreigner, here is a Gentile, here is a Roman and a centurion, a military man on top of it, who sees Jesus' authority. He says, I know that you have authority over me. I know because I am also a man of authority. Look at it. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one go and he goes and that one to come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I wonder when he was telling his friends to go out, when he was telling his friends to go out, and he's repeating this thing, go out and tell Jesus this, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Because I know I am too a man under authority. In other words, I'm thinking he's saying, I know I'm under your authority and I know what authority is like. But I have men that are under me, my, my, uh, my soldiers. I tell this one to go and he goes. I tell this one to come and he comes. And I wonder if he had a tear in his eye or a lump in his throat when he said, and I tell my servant to do this and he does it. But he can't right now because he's lying in a bed dying. But Lord, if you would just say the word. You see, there are times in scripture when Jesus is not present and yet he heals. At least three recorded times that I can think of when Jesus is not even in the same area, not even in the same location, not even in the presence of the one that he's about to heal. And he tells them to go home and they find the same thing that they find out here, that the servant is well. It's amazing that Jesus, all he needs is to say the word, right? That's all you need. That's all I need is for Jesus to be able to say the word. The one who spoke the world into existence and who spoke the stars into the sky and he knows each one by name could certainly take care of your need and my need. Here's a man who should have been a harsh leader. Here's a man who could have been a strong leader. Here's a man who could have been a ferocious and a vile leader. 
in a man of great, of great strength, but yet he was humble. He was a humble leader. I said, Lord, I've got people under me, but I know this. I am under you. A couple of Proverbs speak to this. Listen to them if you would. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22, 4. In Proverbs 15, 33, for the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. You see, I think this is a perfect example. Before honoring this man, as Jesus is about to do, here's the humility of him. Here's the humility of one who would put himself at Jesus' feet. Now, if you are a Bible student, you will know that this is not the only gospel that speaks about this time. And you could look over at Gospel of Matthew and see a similar account that has this, sir, this centurion coming out to Jesus himself. And you would say, Pastor, how do you reconcile those two? You have one that says that he sent out elders, and you have another one that says that he, or another, the same place that says he sent out his friends. But then when you go to Matthew, it says that he came himself. How do you put those two together? Well, I'll tell you how I don't put it together is that one is wrong and one is right because God is never wrong. How I put it together is the way in which I would see this is the same way, a couple of ways to be able to see it. One is, it says that in this passage that he loves our nations, the elder says, and has built our synagogue. Did he really build it all himself? Probably not. He probably was the one who financed it. Maybe, maybe he was the one who drove some nails, but he was certainly probably, in all honesty, never the one who did it all himself. And so when it says that he, he went out and sent some friends, he went out and sent some elders, it was as though he was going himself. That's one possibility. The other one is that he sent the elders, he sent the friends, and when, when Jesus was there, Maybe Jesus was one in which he wanted to make the appeal himself. And so he opens the door and says to him, as he does in Matthew 8, Lord, will you heal my servant? It's interesting that Jesus has nothing but praise for him. Because it's the fourth point, a faith filled Gentile. A faith-filled Gentile. Here is one in which Jesus is going to make a, a accommodation he is going to speak well of like no one that he is going to speak otherwise. He's amazed. Scripture says that he marveled at this centurion's faith. And he turned to the crowd and as if he said, wow, I haven't seen anyone with faith like this in all of Israel. The centurion also remembered he was coming to this one called Jesus. At the very beginning of the passage it says that he had heard about Jesus. Maybe he'd heard about the healings. Maybe he'd heard about this, this mountain message that Jesus had just preached because it says that he'd come down off the mountain when he had finished speaking to the people. Maybe he had heard that. Maybe he had been in the presence of hearing Jesus at that time. It also reminds us that we can't look at the outside appearance of someone when God is looking at their heart. You ever cast somebody aside as there's no hope for them? You ever cast somebody aside and say, they really, I can't do anything to help them. They're kind of a hopeless cause. I tell you what, when Christ is in the midst of it, there is no hopeless cause. 
Christ says, I have come to do the impossible. And with Christ, was it our motto? With Christ, all things are possible, right? And the man whose faith made Jesus marvel was not a disciple. He did no miracles. He planted no churches. He had no degree. He had no religious title. His resume was pretty unimpressive. But the man with the greatest faith in Israel was the centurion who simply knew who Jesus was, what he was able to do, and he humbly asked him and trusted him that he would receive what he needed. He really believed in Jesus. The last verses of this show us exactly what happened. Verse 9, when Jesus heard this, this being the word from his friends, he was amazed at him. And he turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Matthew's account says that he was healed at that moment. There's something to do with us calling. I heard this week <clears throat> someone who said, you know, the that we often call upon the Lord and say, Lord, hear me, hear my prayer. We often do that. We do that when the prayer chain is called. We do that when we, when we pray in the morning, Lord, hear my prayer. And then we have a litany of things that are there that we present before him. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying this, that which is done without faith is of no value. If we're not trusting in him to do as he says he is doing, and he will do, then we are like the waves of the sea being tossed back to and fro, having no real purpose. You've seen enough coverages of the waves in the sea being tossed back to and fro. The last oxymoron I see is this one. It's the title of this message, When Your Illness Has No Answer. So your illness and my illness always has an answer. It always has an answer. It always has a purpose. This man who had a servant who lies about to die had a purpose. And Jesus is about to fulfill that purpose in him. And the purpose of your illness and my illness and your suffering and my suffering is this. One that we would we would make it through to the other side with our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave us in, in one place. He moves us from place to place. He desires that we come through the suffering of time. A pastor friend who lo loses his mom on, in the suddenness of a night, there is a reason behind that. There is a purpose behind that. It's not that he will forsake his faith, but so that his faith will endure and become stronger. It, your faith and my faith become stronger in the storms, in the storms of life as they are in the storms of nature, that which comes through and does not take us out. And there is nothing, the scripture says, can take us out as his children. It makes us stronger. The other thing that we see in this is that our, our illnesses and our sufferings are there to bring glory to God. If you are sick and I am sick, then it is for us to be able to find where can I glorify God in this. Where can I say, God, you have this? Where can I be a testimony to others who are out there? 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do everything you do for the glory of God. You're having a good day, do it for the glory of God. You're having a bad day, do it for the glory of God. You're well, a thousand days, do it for the glory of God. You're sick for a few days, do it for the glory of God. Get well, be a person that brings glory to God, even in your illness. God does not want us turning our back upon him in our time of illness. In this passage, it says that he was healed. Not only do we have an answer to our illness, we know his name. His name is Jesus. We must first recognize our need, humble ourselves, and turn to him whose name is Jesus. And in faith, we call out to him. And in doing so, we will seek his glory. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. You wonder why that the Lord put a centurion in scripture to be able to teach the people of faith a lesson 2,000 years later. You know why it's in here? It's because we need to learn a lesson 2,000 years later. And God didn't choose a mountain man of faith. He didn't choose those who would have said we would have not been able to align with. He chose one of us. You and I are Gentiles. You and I work. You and I are, are people who have people that are around us. And sometimes we have people who are under us. If you're a parent, you likewise fit that category. And in doing so, we need to be able to see as this man does, we are under the authority of Almighty God. And when illness comes, we need to call upon him. That's what he did. When illness comes, we need to humble ourselves. That's what this man did. And when illness comes, we need to call out in faith that's what this man did. And when illness comes, we need to seek, Lord, how can you receive the glory in what is going on in my life? One of the interesting things is, if you go over to Matthew chapter 8, this man not only had faith to be able to see that Jesus would heal, he had a faith that was saving faith. Matthew chapter 8. In verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. Or marveled or amazed. And said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and from the west and take their places at the feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And I believe he is alluding to, and this man will be there. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside to darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurions, go, it will be done as you have believed it would. And, this is, and his centurion was healed at that very hour. There's some religious leaders who are not making it into the kingdom of God, even though they are from the house of Abraham. But here is a Gentile military man, not even of the nation. And the Lord says, I'm going to call them from the east. I'm going to call them from the west. And I'm going to gather them at one time. They're not all going to be of Israel. I'm going to gather them from the other most parts of the country and bring them into my kingdom. Not just a country, but uttermost parts of the world. And there they will be my people. And I will be their God for 